Welcome back to this week's episode of The Emily Show. Today, we're going to be talking very, very briefly about the Frankie Hildebrand sentencing, just so I can let you know what they were sentenced to, why it's frustrating, what the judge had to say, really brief. If you want to watch those sentencings, they are over in full video on my YouTube channel. And then we are going to go over the Petito versus Laundry civil suit, because that is case closed. The Petito family the Schmidt family and the Laundries and attorney Stephen Bertolino have all settled this case. We're going to talk about what they said. We're going to talk about what we learned in the depositions. I hadn't gone over those yet, so I'm going to go over the key moments in the deposition of Christopher Laundry, Roberta Laundry, and Stephen Bertolino for you. And we're going to have a conversation about that settlement and close that case. It's officially done. If you are looking for updates on the Rust trial, those are on the Quick Bits channel over on YouTube, and you can watch me daily streaming during the trial over on the Emily D. Baker channel. That was a lot of places to tell you. If you just want to keep on top of the things, just the Laundered app will just tell you where I am daily because trial time is not real time. I was telling uh, my friend, Judge Abby, that I felt like I was actually in trial and I had I had to be late a day. I had to leave early a day. And I'm like, why am I so stressed? I'm not the lawyers. I'm not actually in trial, but it feels like we're in trial and it feels like you're on jury duty. It does. It's just, we're in trial now. And so we're in trial time. Things get a little wonky. Um, sometimes meals don't get eaten at regular times and emails go unanswered. It's fine. It's trial time. But right now it's podcast time. So let's get into it. Welcome to The Emily Show. I'm Emily D. Baker, the internet's go-to legal analyst and big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years. I'm a former prosecutor, and I break down the legal side of pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. We should just get into it. Let's go. Thank you to today's sponsor, OneSkin. OneSkin is more than just great skincare. It's scientifically created skincare that's here to help you simplify your skincare routine. It was founded by four PhDs dedicated to skin longevity. What is the secret to OneSkin? It's OneSkin's proprietary OS1 peptide. It's the first ingredient scientifically proven to reduce the buildup of sentient cells, those notorious zombie cells that contribute to skin aging. And that means healthier skin, a healthier skin barrier, fewer fine lines and wrinkles. And that is something that's important no matter what time of year it is. And one of the things I really appreciate about One Skin is their easy, environmentally friendly, refillable packaging and how easy it is for me to travel with. Lots of the skincare I have used is really heavy and bulky, but because One Skin simplifies my routine, it makes travel a breeze and it keeps my skin looking great no matter what climate I'm traveling to. Your skin does so much for you. Return the favor with One Skin. For a limited time, Emily Show listeners will get an exclusive 15% off their first One Skin purchase using code LAWNARD at checkout at oneskin.co. Invest in the health and longevity of your skin with One Skin. All right, let's get back to it. Let's talk about the Ruby Frankie Jody Hildebrandt sentencing real quick. I have seen so many wrong headlines about this sentencing and it's because people uh don't understand utah and i get it utah does indeterminate sentencing i have never worked in an indeterminate sentencing jurisdiction i am a a girl who likes a little bit of like closure and control weird i know um so the indeterminate sentencing thing is also a little unsettling for me but it is what it is, and that is the law of the land in the state of Utah. So let me explain what that means and give a quick rundown. Ruby Frankie is a former YouTube family vlogger from her channel, now taken down, called Eight Passenger. That is because there were eight of them in the family. There are six kids and the two adults, Ruby Frankie and her husband, Kevin Frankie. They are in the middle of a divorce. She mentioned that that was one of her greatest sorrows in court, that they were going through divorce. They are still going through the custody battle in the family law court. Um, and that is part of like the CPS action after these child abuse cases were brought. Her 12 year old escaped Jody Hildebrandt's house and ran to a neighbor for help. Police arrested Frankie and Hildebrandt and brought charges against both of them for two victims who were recovered and taken to the hospital and treated for their physical injuries. The psychological, of course, damage takes longer to heal. Those are outlined here on the podcast if you want to know more about the case. 
but both women pled guilty. Both of them pled guilty to four counts and agreed that those four counts would run consecutively. There are two counts for each child. So two counts per victim. So in their plea agreement, they agreed that they would go to prison and that the sentencing would be consecutive one after the other. When you get prison sentence concurrent, you can get sentenced for whatever amount of time on each count. So to take the low term of this count one year, for example, if you were doing it concurrent, you could get sentenced to one year on four counts and running concurrent, you would serve one year and it would count for each of the four counts. When you run it consecutively, if you get one year on four counts, you have to serve them back to back to back. So it would be closer to four years. Of course, there is always a reduced time for good time, work time, and, and other things. That's not what we're really talking about today. Plea agreement. Four counts each. The state dropped two counts. They agreed to prison time. They agreed to consecutive sentencing. Each count, the range for each count is one to 15 years. So each of the defendants were sentenced to one to 15 years for the four counts. Now, you can't just make the math math because Utah. So one to 15 years consecutive means a minimum of four years. The math would give you a maximum of 60 years. However, in Utah, the maximum potential sentence for a second degree felony, and these are aggravated child abuse charges that are second degree felonies, is 30 years. So you cannot get a whole 60 years. And that's where the headlines have been wrong. They're like, oh, one to 15 years times four, four to 60. No, four to 30, four to 30 years. So they were sentenced essentially to four to 30 years. The Department of Corrections in Utah, which is parole and something, will determine the sentence later. So these women will not know the sentence that they are getting themselves. They know it's a minimum of four years until later. They both sort of participated in a pre-sentencing investigation. The pre-sentencing investigation would be a substantial report that not only looks at the police report, but can speak to the prosecutor, the defense attorneys, the defendants can speak to the guardian ad litem for the children can speak to the other parent. I don't know if that was done here or not. These are not public documents at this time, and they might not be because of the sensitive nature of the victims in this case, and depending on who they talk to. But the pre-sentence investigation spoke to everybody except for uh, Jody Hildebrandt. She chose not to speak to the Department of Probation and Parole and reserved her statement for sentencing, which is her right to do. But the court definitely wanted to know, hey, hey, you pled so why aren't you having any involvement in the pre-sentencing investigation? And then any recorded jail calls, any other back history will all be sent to the Department of Probation and Parole, and they will get to decide the sentence looking at all of the things and the behavior of these women in custody when they get into custody because they're going to do at least four years. So the judge had much stronger words for Jody Hildebrandt than Ruby Frankie. It seems that everyone involved in this case from the prosecutor on down believes that Jody Hildebrandt is the more culpable party, which sometimes is hard to wrap your head around when Ruby Frankie is the mother of the children. Ruby Frankie's statement to the court was extensive. She thanked everybody from the prosecutors and law enforcement to the persons at the hospital to members of her church to the judge to her husband, uh, apologized-ish to her children. That's all over on my YouTube channel. I covered the entire sentencing. She genuinely did say that she caused abuse. She talked about being essentially brainwashed. She didn't use those words, but that her belief in right and wrong was altered by Hildebrandt and said Hildebrandt kind of made her do this, that if it weren't for Hildebrandt, she wouldn't have treated her children this way and that she's now just starting to unwind the wrongness in her thinking. But she did seem to show some remorse and she did seem to say, I want to understand what I did wrong here. It's always strange when you have to parse child abuse that way because I don't think there's a lot of gray zone on how wrong that is but that's in her statement. 
When you get to Jody Hildebrandt, the prosecutor made an interesting note that we didn't know about before. And the prosecutor's statement was that Jody Hildebrandt was in recorded jail calls, which will all be provided for consideration in her sentencing, indicating that she is a victim in all of this, that the children are to blame, the almost 12-year-old and almost nine-year-old child are to blame. To, to blame. And that everything that's being said about her, including what would be said at sentencing, is lies. So the judge had much stronger words for Jody Hildebrand and asked Jody Hildebrand's attorney if she understood the wrongness of her actions. And really, the judge gave her some strong words. Afterwards, when the prosecutor was interviewed, the prosecutor did say that he believed that the four-year minimum was okay when it came to Ruby Frankie, but was hoping for substantially more time for Jody Hildebrandt. So in everything that the prosecutor said in their statement after this sentencing, they clearly believe that Hildebrandt is not just the more dangerous party, but the more culpable party and the party that has shown no remorse and no acceptance that what she did was abuse. And that means that the rehabilitation of Jody Hildebrandt is going to take substantially longer because you can't have someone uh, getting out of custody thinking that this is okay behavior. Also, it was brought up by the prosecutor and by the judge that Jody Hildebrandt does have a background as a licensed therapist and that her violation of trust and of her position of power and using her licensure and using that knowledge to then lead parents into uh, not a parenting style, but into abusing their own children, put her in a level of culpability that is higher. We will maybe know what happens down the road, but it could be two or three years before the Department um, of Corrections or Probation and Parole determines how long these women will stay in custody. So it's going to be at least four years in prison, and it'll probably be longer than that for at least Jody Hildebrandt. So is there a ton of closure? Not yet. But these women are going to prison. The case is done. It's not going to be appealed. The amount of restitution will be determined in the future. And that is the end of what was for some a shocking arrest in the case of Ruby Frankie, and for others was an arrest that took way too long to happen, especially considering that one of the adult children of Ruby Frankie did call Child Protective Services on her family to protect her younger siblings, seemingly before Frankie ever became involved with Jody Hildebrandt. And make of that what you will. Let's move on to the Petito Laundry civil case. So for those of you that have not been following the Petito and Laundry civil lawsuit, I'm going to give you a quick road so far because I think it's important context for where we're at now with this case settling. Gabby Petito's parents, who are Joseph Petito and Nicole Schmidt, I call them the Petito family, A, because it's easier, and B, because I don't ever want to leave one out, not out of any disrespect to Gabby Petito's mother, just because the name recognition is easier when we go with Petito family, laundry family, for me as a broadcaster. The Petito parents sued the laundry parents for essentially intentional infliction of emotional distress over a statement made by their attorney, Stephen Bertolino. Early on through the lawsuit, attorney Stephen Bertolino was brought in as a co-defendant. So we have uh, the Petito family, the Laundry family, and attorney Stephen Bertolino. He's the one that was talking to the media quite a lot. All of the wild information about this case as it was ongoing was coming from Stephen Bertolino. He's the one who said on the last day Brian Laundry was seen, he appeared to be grieving. And everybody's like, um, that's new information. He was texting with broadcasters. I'm glad that he was. It was um, it was illuminating information in a case where we didn't have a ton of information. So the civil lawsuit was intentional infliction of emotional distress for the statement made to the media. What are the meaning of the words in those statements? Did those words cause parents who were searching for a missing child 
was it a statement that you would not expect to see in a civilized and polite society? Was it just so far outside the bounds of accepted human behavior as to be outrageous? And though the laundry behavior was not uh, was not great, I don't think it was ideal, was the statement by the lawyer essentially saying, we hope that the search for Gabby Petito um, reunites her with her family, I'm paraphrasing, is that type of statement to the media by a lawyer the type of statement that is going to really be considered for intentional infliction of emotional distress? The law in Florida had not been used that way. It is uh, reminded by the defense attorneys frequently that in Florida, the bar for what is considered outrageous conduct is very high when we are talking about cases of intentional infliction of emotional distress. Was Bertolito's thought in making the statement, was the was the laundry thought in making the statement along with him to cause distress to the Petitos or was it something else? And we're going to see that when we get into the depositions today and look at what was said by both Roberta and Christopher Laundry about what they thought when the statement was made and a little bit from Bertolino, who was quite defensive in his uh, deposition or the part that he filed and that we have. So in all of this, this is not an easy case. This is a difficult legal case to prove, and I've covered that over on YouTube quite a bit, including the motions for summary judgment. However, the emotional side of this case is very difficult. The emotional side of this case, you have... Roberta Laundrie's very odd burn after reading letter. Don't worry, they ask her about it in the deposition and I'm not leaving that part out. We have the fact that Brian Laundrie murdered Gabby Petito and that her parents didn't know where she was for over a month. The Laundrie's lawyers are in the unenviable position of having to argue that the distress and pain and emotional distress that the Petito family was in is because their daughter was missing, not because of any statement made to the media. And that's a difficult gray zone to have to parse in court. And I think credit where credit is due that the laundry family attorney has navigated that well in their filings. I think that they have navigated sensitively acknowledging the distress and the pain of the Petito family while also trying to argue the legal sides of this case. And this case is difficult. It is emotionally difficult. And the legal standard and the legal obligations and the emotional side of it are very different. And that's a hard thing sometimes for a jury to navigate. The morality of the behavior of the Laundry family after Brian Laundry called them and said, Gabby's missing, I need a lawyer. We're going to hear more from Christopher Laundrie about what that phone call with his son was like. And then the legal side of it with what other statement could they make to the media? And is this statement directed at them or is it directed at those that were outside the Laundrie's home with bullhorns and banging on their doors and windows and blocking the street and the death threats they were getting? Is it more directed at that? So... It's a difficult legal case, and we're not going to know the answer because they settled. <laughs> so the legal questions remain unanswered. Here is my hope as we dive into this and get into the depositions a little bit. I hope that the Petito family got at least some of the answers that they were looking for so they can begin the very uh, difficult and impossible task of healing from the loss of a child and the loss of a child at the hands of their fiance and also having it a massive media case and also having the additional betrayal of the fiance's family completely stonewalling them so that there was no communication at all after it was made public that Gabby was missing because the Laundries knew well before the Petitos did that Gabby was gone. And I hope that they can start to heal. So let's talk about the settlement statements that were made. Um, this reporting is coming from J.B. Buno on WFLA. WFLA is a news station out of Florida that we all became really familiar with 
during their reporting of Gabby Petito being missing. They were there for a kind of every turn of event. They were talking to the lawyers because so much of this centered around Florida, where the Laundries live, where Brian Laundry came back to after Gabby was murdered in Wyoming, where the van was, where the searches happened. So they were locally centered there and did incredible coverage of this case and other both local and national news stories. And we learned so much about this case from them. And they broke the news that this case had settled. And the lawyers gave statements to uh, JB and WFLA. So that's the reporting that we are going to for this. Thank you to our sponsor, Shopify. Shopify is what powers the Law Nerd Shop, where so many of you have been getting your limited edition matte black on black laundered tumbler what i love about shopify is it lets us sell a variety of items and we can send them through different distribution channels so the tumblers can ship from a different company then we're using to manufacture your favorite black on black fax hat but no matter what you're selling from merchandise to handmade goods, Shopify can support your store. Whether you're selling online because they are an all-in-one, easy to set up e-commerce platform, or if you're selling in person, Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout, 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the US, including brands you know, like Allbirds and Rothy's, and Shopify has award-winning customer service. So if you get stuck, they're there to help. It's no wonder that businesses that grow grow with Shopify. If you're ready to check it out for yourself, I have a deal for you. Sign up for a $1 per month trial at shopify.com slash lawnard. Remember, lawnard is all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash lawnard. See how you can grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash lawnard. And you'll be hearing this sound soon. And this was uh, posted on February 21st. The family of Gabby Petito reached an agreement with the family of Brian Laundry and their attorney during mediation on Wednesday and will avoid a civil trial, the family members told News Channel 8. The family held discussions in a secret location. Quote, after a long day of mediation, a confidential, we're never going to know, a confidential resolution has been reached between the parents of Gabby Petito, the parents of Brian Laundry, and attorney Stephen Bertolino, to which all parties reluctantly agreed in order to avoid further legal expenses and prolonged personal conflict. Petito's family said in a statement released by the family attorney, quote, our hope is to close this chapter of our lives to allow us to move on and to continue to honor the legacy of our beautiful daughter, Gabby. In a statement to WFLA.com, Bertolino said, quote, Christopher and Roberta Laundrie and I participated in mediation with the Petito family and the civil lawsuit has now been resolved. The terms of the resolution are confidential and we look forward to putting this matter behind us. And then it goes on to summarize the lawsuit. There was one final statement made to JB that he posted on Twitter. So we're going to look at that too. JB said, Justin, Gabby Petito's family says they have obtained answers through deposition and their focus now shifts to spending time with their families and fostering at Gabby's foundation. They will not be doing interviews, they add. This is the final statement we get on this case, which is, Joe and Tara Petito, along with Nikki and Jim Schmidt, have endured a difficult and emotional two and a half years, resulting in a resolution through mediation on February 21st, 2024. Throughout this time, the primary objective of Gabby Petito's family in pursuing litigation was to seek answers to lingering questions. And that is what I have long suspected and speculated about with this case that they were not looking for any kind of monetary recompensation. Nothing can compensate them for what they've lost. Nothing can change what they've lost. Nothing can bring back what they've lost. I think they wanted answers and I think they had a right to be outraged and to want answers. Having obtained these answers through depositions, their focus now shifts to spending time with and prioritizing their families and fostering the Gabby Petito Foundation. As a result, they have decided not to take part in any interviews. Nevertheless, they wish to extend their heartfelt gratitude and appreciation to all who have supported them during these trying times. And I think that's the end of it. 
I think those three statements and a confidential settlement is all we are going to ever see from this case. I hope that the Petito family and the Laundry family are able to start to figure out what they do to move forward. I imagine for the Laundry family that will include moving because people were posted up outside their house with vitriol and there still aren't warm feelings towards the laundry family and after i read these depositions um there 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 may be continued not warm feelings towards the laundry family i was kind of horrified watching people go up to their house bang on their house um scream death threats at them i understand people had strong feelings about this case of course they did but going real world with Brian Laundrie's parents was um, odd to me, was uncalled for, and I think made the situation worse. In all of that, we're going to get to the depositions, but my friend, Philip Dubé, who is a regular commentator on Court TV, on News Nation and elsewhere, who I worked with uh, when I was a DA, he was and still is a practicing defense attorney. He made a really interesting comment on my posts about this on Twitter, and I don't post a ton on Twitter. I try to do really just a basic case update here and there. I really focus my attention, A, on YouTube, B, on the podcast, B, one on the Law Nerd app. So on Twitter, Philip said, quote, my gut tells me that the Laundry's civil attorney was insurance defense counsel appointed by their homeowner's insurance. If correct, their carrier can settle and pay the claim on their dime without client consent. Ryan Gilbert is their lawyer who has an insurance defense cachet. So it might be, and I hadn't even really thought about it. I did criminal for so long that I don't always consider the fact that, yes, sometimes homeowners insurance will cover lawyers in civil lawsuits. And I should think about it more. We're covering Amber Heard suing all of her insurance over paying for lawyers in the Depp Heard case. It didn't even cross my mind in this case that part of the reluctant settlement might be that attorneys decided to settle even if the laundries didn't want to or even if the petitos didn't want to but the reality of the situation is that this lawsuit was going to be expensive it was going to be extensive and it was going to be emotionally exhausting when you go through a lawsuit you are on trial and when you go through a civil lawsuit your actions and your emails and your text messages and your thoughts that's all on trial. It would have been a dehumanizing experience for everyone involved in this case, Petitos and Laundries. And the reality is when they sat down at mediation and looked at all the depositions and looked at what the law says, they're like, this is going to be a hard fight. If somebody had won at summary judgment, meaning the case got dismissed, it would have been appealed. If people had lost at summary judgment, it would have been appealed. If it went to trial, it would have been appealed. Like this case wasn't going to end. This is an end. And I hope that the finality is helpful. But these depositions are evasive. Bertolino's is more aggressive, but they're evasive. And there's some stuff in that that's odd to me. And I'm sure you guys want the tea. So let's just, let's get into the depositions. At the end of the day, answers don't bring anybody back but hopefully they are going to help find at least the ability to say, I'm done asking more questions about this. This case in Florida was going to be thoroughly litigated, which means it was going to be expensive. We're going to start with the Bertolino deposition. Then we're going to look at Christopher Laundry's deposition. And then we are going to look at Roberta Laundry's deposition because they asked Roberta Laundrie all about the burn after reading letter. Y yes, they do. I'm not going to go through every single line of every deposition. We will be here for 17 hours if I do that. I mean, that's an exaggeration. Maybe not really. Maybe sort of. We are going to go through kind of the key parts of the depositions. I have read them. There are other parts I will summarize. Stephen Bertolino did not submit into the record his entire deposition. I will try to get the rest of the deposition but I am just going to go over the part where Bertolino is talking about his statement, the statement that ultimately was sued over. The attorney for Bertolino is very quick to jump in and remind Bertolino that there is still an attorney-client communication and attorney-client privacy 
between him and Brian Laundrie. So helping him stay very clear and reminding the other attorneys to stay very clear of what conversations with Brian and what might have come from conversations with Brian, that that information cannot come in. The Laundries waived their attorney-client privilege to be very forthcoming in their depositions. Well, you could decide about that. In the portion of the deposition that Bertolino filed, they asked him about him hiring lawyers in Wyoming, and he talks about reaching out to the public defender's office and getting recommendations for criminal defense attorneys. He cannot say what Brian said to him made him do that, but we know that Brian called his parents frantic, said, I need help, said, I need a lawyer, and then Bertolino was calling the public defender's office to get recommendations for criminal defense attorneys in the area where Gabby Petito was murdered. So when you look at those things all together, I think most of us can surmise that even if the words were not said, the feeling was there that what had happened was criminal and a criminal defense attorney was needed. And then we get to the statement from September 14th that Bertolino and the Laundries are being sued over. The question to Stephen Bertolino is, what was the purpose in issuing this statement? Answer, at that time on that day, September 14th, remember Brian Laundry left the Laundry House September 13th, and this statement was issued September 14th, before Gabby Petito was found, before Brian Laundrie was found. So Bertolino is saying, at that time, on that day, and look, I'm pausing so I can keep my composure because I don't mean to be nasty. That's not my goal here. It's not. But you represent your side, and I represent mine. And at that time that this was given, my clients were going through hell. And I know that's a problem for the other side to understand. I'm going to get back into the direct quotes here. Remember, the Petitos are watching this deposition. And I know that's a problem for the other side to understand. He goes on to say, to even comprehend that the other side could be going through hell too. They had throngs of public with bullhorns. They had press. And to my knowledge, some of it was being pushed upon by your clients, okay? When he says your clients, he means the Petito family. And I read their text messages in the discovery, and they were gloating over it. Oh, let's get more people out there. And they were successful. So he's pushing back at the Petito family lawyer saying, I've read all their text messages in Discovery, which would have come out if this went to trial. And they were gloating about how many people were at the laundry house. That's his statement. And I don't fault them for it. They should have done all of that to find their daughter. I don't truly fault them for it. But from my chair, from my role in this unfortunate saga, I had to represent my clients and they were being threatened. Death threats beyond compare. Now, your side was not getting that. Sir, didn't you just say you didn't want to be a dick? I mean, I'm summarizing, but sir, quote, now your side was not getting that. They were getting sympathy. They were getting help, as they should have. But my clients, Chris and Roberta, did not deserve what was happening to them, and they were going through hell. And the reason I can pin down that Brian left on the 13th is because I said to Brian, gee, would you have come home? Would you have come home with what you saw down the block? I don't know if Brian came home that night, made a left turn onto the block, saw what everyone saw publicly happening outside his home. But what I said to the FBI Monday night or Tuesday morning, quote, what would you do? Would you want to walk through that crowd? So on Tuesday the 14th, when the crowd kept getting bigger, bigger and the anger kept brewing and the hostilities were growing and the death threats were coming in by the dozens to my client's house, to my office, to my staff, outside of my office, to my children. You need to understand, and maybe your clients never want to understand. This was a difficult time for two families. My clients were going through hell and this needed to be conveyed. And I consulted with my clients on this letter and I consulted with Fleener and Peterson out there in Wyoming, and we all agreed something, anything needed to be said to remain silent would have smacked of indifference. Hey, we don't even care. I know. Look at your smirk. 
we don't care. We did care. I don't know who in the room was smirking when he said smacked of indifference or if it was someone on Zoom, but he's responding to someone in the room when he says that. Then there's a question. You kept silent for, and the interruption by Stephen Bertolino is, excuse me, I'm not done with my answer, counselor. I'm not done with my answer. You'll have your turn. Question, go ahead, continue. That's from uh, the Petito's lawyer. Answer, he's on a monologue now. So you wanna know what the purpose was? The purpose was in some way, in some small way, to let the public know, hey, this is a difficult time for two families, for both sides here. And the second paragraph was to let them know all we knew. We being myself, Chris and Roberta in that small environment. It is our understanding and I can tell you, I made a phone call to Tom Fleener and I asked him, do you know where this investigation is going? Because it's all very fuzzy on the news. All we know on our end, all we knew was that somewhere out there, there was an investigation starting. And I called Fleener and Peterson and I spoke to Tom. Then Bertolino's lawyer interjects and says, you just have to be careful what you spoke to them about. I think Bertolino's lawyer knows that Bertolino gets on a roll and keeps talking and says, well, this is on there. And I said, do you know where the investigation is taking place? And his response was, no, man, we don't. We've been watching TV. We don't know. They think it was near Bridger Teton. And that's where we got the second part from is that we believed, and that's what it says, quote, it is our understanding that a search has been organized for Miss Petito in or near Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming. And the second sentence in that second paragraph is that Chris and Roberta were truly hopeful, truly hopeful that that search would be successful, as was I. So yes, the purpose of the statement was written to let the public know, to let the press know, to let the hooligans outside of their house, to let every individual who was threatening to kill us, including, as I learned, some people on your side of the table, to let them know this is difficult for us. And we truly hope we truly hope that your success brings Gabby back. And if that meant dead or alive, as in reunited, that's what it meant. We were hopeful that she would be found alive. And the last part, Mr. Riley, Mr. Riley being the Petito's attorney, if I'm reading this in angry voice, I'm trying to convey the fact that I feel like this is probably how he's saying it in deposition and why he would be terrible on trial because he would come across as totally defensive. And the last part, Mr. Riley, is to let the public know, as I've said numerous times publicly, and I do not shy away from this, that on the advice of counsel, Chris and Roberta were remaining silent. As an attorney, as a layperson who watched television would know, shut up and don't say anything. And I know in your world, you would have preferred that we stay silent, and that would not have been any good either. And we looked at it as though silence would have been indifference, a total screw you. We didn't care. And I understand that that's how this letter was taken. And I'm sorry for that. But that's not what the purpose of the letter was for. And now it's your turn. And then Mr. Riley says, to quote you, to remain silent would have smacked of indifference, but you remain silent for 17 days or longer. The attorney objected. And Bertolino said, because the crowds and the hordes of people that were threatening myself and more importantly, threatening Chris and Roberta outside their own home 24 hours a day began on the 13th. And that's why the letter was written on the 14th to try to tone down a little bit if possible. The question from the lawyer is, but you don't think that silence smacked of indifference from August 29th until September 14th? Answer from Bertolino, there were two things with that. Number one, Chris and Roberta did not have any information to share, number one. And if they did have information, it was very little, such as maybe the phrase, Gabby is gone. What are we going to do with that? Any information that I may or may not have had, I could not share either. Question. Well, quote, Gabby is gone would have been helpful to let the family know that she was no longer living, most likely. And number two, that the phone call had come from Jackson. It would have given the family an idea of where to look. Wouldn't you agree? The answer is no, I don't. Because if I would have went out there to say Chris and Roberta believe that Brian was in Jackson, right? And let's say he was in Yellowstone, you would be suing us for giving you false information. You would be suing us and saying you pointed us in the wrong direction. And we had said, oh, she's gone. You would have said, well, what does that mean? What does that mean? We don't know what it meant. Question. You knew what it meant. 
He came home with her van. All her possessions were in the van. She was not with him. You knew she was dead. That's the question from Pat Riley. Answer, Chris and Roberta did not know, and anything that I may or may not have known would have been attorney-client privilege with Brian. That is very carefully parsed for a lawyer that is kind of loquacious because Pat Riley says, you knew she was dead. And the answer from attorney Stephen Bertolino is, Chris and Roberto did not know. And anything that I may or may not have known would have been attorney-client privilege with Brian. Question, so how do you believe this statement was going to calm the crowd outside your client's home? Answer, it was meant to convey what the laundries Chris and Roberta could say at that moment, which was not much other than to let people know, hey, we're going through a difficult time here too. Our son walked out the door. They didn't say that. And in fact, Northport police said after this that they knew exactly where Brian Laundrie was. Mm-hmm. 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 Our son walked out the door. We may not have known for sure he was going to kill himself, but that was certainly a suspicion in the back of our minds. So on the 14th, they were worried that Brian had taken his own life. They reported him missing on the 13th, but Northport police said they knew exactly where Brian was days after that. That comes up again in Roberta's deposition. Bertolino goes on to say, so now they just lost their son. We don't know what to do with that. We don't know what to do with law enforcement, and we're stuck here in this situation with all these people outside ready to kill us. It goes on to say, who was this statement addressed to? Is it to Gabby's family or to the public? Answer, it was addressed, I'm sorry. The statement was addressed to the public, to the press, and yes, I suspected it would reach the Petito family. Question, you were expressing your hope, so I would think it was intended to address the Petito family, correct? Answer, that particular phrase was a general phrase that we had hoped that the search would be successful. Conveying that to the public, to the press, to the angry protesters with their pitchforks and burning at the stake mentality that were threatening my clients and threatening me, my staff, and my children as well. Question, by the way, you mentioned that someone on my side of the table threatened to kill someone. Who did that? Answer, I don't know who, but if Rick Stafford is honest, we'll find out. Question, what does that mean? Answer, Rick Stafford told me explicitly, explicitly that there were people on, and that is the end of the transcript. So he is not only extremely defensive, it seems to me he probably knew that um, Brian killed Gabby after his privileged conversations with Brian, and he believes that people on the Petito side of the table were also making death threats against them. There's a lot of accusations in Bertolino's deposition. Will I try to get the entire thing if you're interested in it? Yet, you're, yes, you're going to have to let me know if you're interested in it. And then we will grab it and go through it if you want me to, probably after the rest trial, because we've got two more depositions to go through. One thing that I found very odd about the deposition with Brian Laundrie's father is a portion where they were asking about Brian's sister. Um, Brian's sister had spoken to the media some in this case, but they were asking just general background question. When was Brian born? When did he go to high school? What was he like in high school? When did you hire Stephen Bertolino? Like foundational questions. And then they're talking about Brian's sister. And the strangest part of this is that he doesn't seem to know what name his daughter goes by. The question is, does she still go by Cassandra Laundry, or does she have a different name? Answer, I don't even know. I don't know what name she takes. Is she married? Yeah. What's her husband name? husband's name? And then it's given. And do you know if she's taken his married name? No. They have children. Yes. How many children? Two. And they go by the husband's last name. I have no idea. The answer is, I have no idea. I have no idea. The beginning of the deposition and Christopher Laundrie is saying he does not know the last name of his grandchildren. Sir, what? The note on the transcript for me is what? And that is how this entire deposition goes. You do not know the name, the last name of your grandchildren. So the next question from the attorney is, do you not have a relationship with Cassandra, the daughter? 
because that's an, are you estranged? Do you not speak? Do you not have a relationship with Cassandra? No, I have a relationship, but it's, I just don't know that, you know, maybe she does, maybe she doesn't. I would have no reason to ask her about that. I would have no reason to ask her about, this is the beginning of the deposition. I would have no reason to ask her about that, about the, about the, about the last name of your grandchildren, about your daughter's name. You're confused about your daughter's name. It goes on to say, did you attend her wedding? Yes. And do you know if they announced that she was now Mrs. Lutz, the husband's last name? No, it was a no. And then they get into what was the date of Brian's passing. And he said, I believe it was the 13th of October. I mean, September, the day he left my house, I never saw him again. So he was going through, I think that the day he left the house on September 13th, the day before the statement that's being sued over came out, is the day that he passed away. But the beginning of this deposition sits so weird with me when he doesn't know the last name of the kids and he doesn't know the last name of his daughter. And these are the kids with that husband. It, it's not like there's a complex family dynamic here, or maybe there is a more complex family dynamic that we just don't know. I, it seemed odd to me that he's like, I have no reason to ask my daughter what her last name is after she got married. No, I, it, it's just odd to me. I'm going to skip through a lot of the foundational stuff. They ask about the relationship with Gabby. He said, I loved Gabby. My wife loved Gabby. And then they get into talking about the van trip. What was going on with the van trip? Remember, Brian and Gabby were living with the Petitos before they took their, you know, cross-country van trip. But it seems that nobody had a conversation. And Brian and Gabby Petito moved all of their stuff out into a storage unit. Everything moved out of the laundry house. But the laundries thought they were just going from Florida to New York for a graduation and to visit Gabby's grandfather. And they didn't think it was going to be that long of a trip but then everything was in the storage unit, but then they didn't know it was in a storage unit. Christopher Laundry, Brian's father, saw a receipt on the counter and realized that they had cleaned out all of their possessions from their house. And no one had a conversation about it. Moved everything out of the house to a storage unit and just nobody noticed. Nobody knew, nobody asked a question. They didn't know how long of a trip they were going for. They thought they were just going Florida to New York. It's so they were living in the same house. They asked Christopher Laundry if he ever became aware of the incident in Moab, the domestic violence incident and the police incident. And he said that he never knew until the news spoke to him about it. So they're asking about whether he ever knew about the incident in Moab, that the police were involved. And they said, Brian never told us. And then right after that incident in Moab, Brian came home, flew home and emptied out the storage unit. Question. Why is it that Brian came back to do that instead of asking you to do it? Answer, we offered to do it. He seemed anxious to come home and say, you know, maybe he just wanted to come home, you know? Question, well, that was five days after the Moab incident. Was there anything that you observed about Brian when he came home that caused you concern? No. And he didn't tell you that there had been a police incident between he and Gabby just days before? No. And he seemed fine? He did. Did he have any bruising on him that you're aware of? No. Do you know why he came home alone? I have, I don't know why he came home alone. I thought he just wanted to come and see us and say hello. Did you ask him why Gabby didn't come with him? It sounded as if she wanted to take time to make her website. So that was the only reason, the only reason that he said she couldn't do it while she was there. I don't know. And then they talked about Gabby staying in a hotel. They talk about the fact that he flew back and forth. Even though he was worried about money at the storage unit, he flew back to Florida, moved stuff out of the storage unit, and then flew back to Salt Lake City. And then we get into a series of phone calls from August 27th and Christopher Laundry is trying to get in touch with Brian, calls him and leaves him a voicemail at 3.12 in the afternoon, at 4.21 in the afternoon, at 5.11 in the afternoon. And the question is, why were you every hour for a three hour period leaving messages on Brian's voicemail on August 27th? The answer from his father is, I don't even know what day that is. What is that date? I don't know. Question, well, that's the date the FBI believes Gabby was murdered. Do you know why you would have called him three times within a three-hour period and left him voice messages? The answer is, I might have just been wanting to talk to him. The thing is, if you go to trial, 
that timing looks odd. Then it says, looking at the phone, there was a call from you again to Brian at 8 p.m. I'm sorry, at 9.30 p.m. Do you see that? Yes. And you spoke with Brian for five minutes and 42 seconds, according to this. Do you recall what you spoke about? No, I don't. Do you recall if on that date Brian told you anything about Gabby? I don't. I don't know the date in my mind here. Do you have any recollection of the phone call? No. Do you know if Brian and your wife spoke on August 28th? Yeah, I spoke with Brian, I'm pretty sure. Why are you sure you spoke with Brian on August 28th? Well, I spoke to him when we were at Daytona. We arrived on Friday and I called him that day. I don't know if that's the date here or not. On the 27th, I spoke to him on the 27th for sure. And then they go on about uh, the race at Daytona and that's how he's kind of checking time, which I actually don't blame him for because I would do that too because dates get fuzzy and it would be like, okay, this thing was on this day and it would kind of anchor an event. But then they're trying to figure out when Brian returned to Florida to stay. They talk about the phone calls being fine. And then they talk after the race at Daytona. The day after the race, you said you went to, yeah, I spoke to Brian. Question, what did you speak with him about? Answer, he called. Well, that's the day everything, you know, hit the fan, I think. Question, how did everything hit the fan? That Brian, you know, Roberta had spoke to Brian that day, I think. And when he spoke, she got off the phone. She said to me, Brian said, and then the attorney says, we're going to assert spousal privilege. So whatever was said between the two spouses will not be disclosed. So what is said between Brian and Christopher? Yes. What is said between Roberta and Brian? Yes. But what is said between Roberta and Christopher? Absolutely not. So the attorney made that objection about spousal privilege. So anything said between the two spouses will not be disclosed. So the next question is, without telling me what she said to you, how did the shit hit the fan that day? Answer, I didn't say that. How did the stuff hit the fan? He said, things hit the fan. And now they're fighting over words. Question, how did things hit the fan that day? Well, I, what did you learn about Brian? I called Brian because, you know, I felt I should call him. So I called him. In Roberta's deposition, by the way, she says, I told him to call. In Roberta's depo, in Roberta's depo she said, I told Christopher to call Brian. What did he say to you? I asked him, you know, how is he doing? And he, you know, he was not calm. He got very excited and he told me things had, you know, quote, Gabby's gone and he got very frantic. Everything was frantic and quick. So, you know, Gabby's gone. Question, meaning what? Well, I have no idea what he meant. Well, what else did he say? Answer, well, it was quick. He said, you know, and he was very panicked and he didn't know what to do. And he said, you know, quote, can you help me? you know, and he might need a lawyer, you know, and I would, I asked him why he wouldn't tell me he was very frantic. Everything was frantic. And I started to not really comprehend. And then he just said, you know, can you help me? And I said, okay, I'll help you. And I calmed him down. And I said, I don't know. It was, it was all mumbled. And I still don't remember everything that happened, but you know, he said he needed help and to get an attorney. And I told him, yeah, I'll help you. I'll call Steven Bertolino and I'll just, and just stay put. And then I asked him again, and he just said, just help me. And I said, yeah, I'm going to. So stay calm, stay put. And he hung up. Did he say where he was? He did. He did. Where did he say he was? Jackson. Jackson what? That's all he said. Jackson, Wyoming. He didn't say that. Was there other Jackson out west you were aware of? No. Did he say he murdered Gabby? No. Question. He said she was gone. He said it several times. Question. And he was frantic. Answer, frantic. And he said he needed a lawyer. He did. Okay, did you understand that to mean that something had happened to Gabby? I understood it to mean there was something wrong. Okay, something was wrong meaning what? Answer, I had no idea. Question, well, your son's frantic. He wants you to call a lawyer and Gabby's gone. Did you believe at that time that he'd murdered her? Answer, no. Did you believe that she was dead at that time? Answer, not at all. Question, what did you think gone meant? Answer, I didn't even know what to think at the moment, you know, at all. So that's that. Question, well, if he told you that she was gone, but she had just walked away, would he have been frantic, do you think? Answer, all I know is he told me and it was very quick and very, very nervous and very scattered. So I don't remember everything he said, but he said he needed help 
and I calmed, I tried to calm him down and he would not calm down and he hung up on me. Question. And then after the telephone call, did you contact attorney Bertolino? After that call, yes. Okay. What did you contact your attorney Bertolino about? That just, just what was going on. I called him, told him the same thing. Let him know that that's what had happened. Question. Tell me what you told him. Answer. I told him Brian called me. He was frantic. I didn't know what to do. And this is what he said. At first I thought, I don't know. I didn't see him or speak to him that often. So he didn't even know who Gabby was. So then he had to clarify that he doesn't speak to Bertolino that often. So Bertolino didn't know Brian was engaged to Gabby, et cetera. Yeah. So I explained who Gabby was and everything. And Brian was on a trip and he called me and I called him. And this is what he told me. You know, that's it. So that's what I told him. Question. Did you tell attorney Bertolino that you were concerned that Gabby was dead? Answer. After the conversation of how frantic he was and, you know, it was something I thought we had to consider. Is it spring yet? Well, with our sponsor, Fast Growing Trees, you don't have to wait for spring to liven up either your living space or your yard. We have used Fast Growing Trees to find pet-friendly plants for our house because we truly don't get a ton of direct sun, so we needed to make sure we could find plants that would work with our lighting situation and our pets and Fast Growing Trees made it so easy to do. Fast Growing Trees is the biggest online nursery in the U.S. with more than 10,000 different kinds of plants and over 2 million happy customers. And what's wild to me is they actually have lemon, avocado, and fig trees that you can grow inside your home. Fast Growing Trees makes it super easy to order online and your plants are shipped directly to your door within one to two days and you don't have to worry because they offer a 30-day Alive and Thrive guarantee and they offer a free plant consultation forever. Right now, Fast Growing Trees has their best deals online and you can get up to half off select plants. And listeners of The Emily Show get an additional 15% off when using code Lawnard at checkout. That's an additional 15% off when using code Lawnard at checkout. So head to fastgrowingtrees.com and use code Lawnard. The offer is valid for a limited time and don't forget to tell them The Emily Show sent you. Let's get back to today's episode. And the reason they're asking about this is because if this was going to go to trial, which it didn't, it settled, they were trying to prove that at the time the September 14th public statement was made, that they believed Gabby to be dead. And in this phone call to attorney Bertolino on August 29th, long before the September 14th statement was made, before Brian even returned to Florida, uh, Brian didn't talk to attorney Bertolino till September 1st, but the answer from Christopher Laundry is after the conversation of how frantic he was, you know, it was something I thought we had to consider putting the possibility out there that Christopher Laundry at the end of August believed, or at least was considering that Gabby was dead. And I think that he is very much distancing himself from this by trying to space out that language. So the fact that there's this little glimpse of, I think we had to consider it means that he absolutely thought or was thinking or was considering that the only reason someone would be that frantic or panicked was because it was really, really bad. There is then more questioning about what else this call could have meant. Question. Okay. And if she just left and walked away, do you think he would have needed an attorney for that answer? It was, it was a situation of how frantic he was. I had no idea what to think. He asked me to get a lawyer and I couldn't get any more information from him. Okay. Answer. And I did what he asked. Question. He didn't say she walked away, right? Answer. Not that I know of. I don't remember, but I don't think he did. Question. He didn't say she was kidnapped by anyone, did he? No. And what did attorney Bertolino say to you? Well, he said, well, then we did discuss that, you know, maybe maybe something seriously happened and you know we would act accordingly to keep everything we don't know so that's so that's that's it that's his answer that is a direct verbatim quote from this deposition maybe something seriously happened and then word salad and then that's it pat riley's questioning was a uh, fierce question so gabby was someone who'd lived with you correct yes someone you said you loved yes and you knew her parents would have wanted to know if something happened to her, correct? Yes. Okay, did you consider calling her parents? No. Why? You never considered calling her parents? Answer, I didn't know because I had no reason to. 
at that very moment to think anything was was going on gabby took off and did things that i know you know she on her own free will so i had no idea what where she was on that same depot page sentences above he says he's had a phone call with the lawyer to hire criminal attorneys because they think something seriously bad happened and now when he's being asked why didn't you let her parents know he's like sometimes she just goes off on her own free will you know uh so, sometimes it's just she just uh, does things it then goes on question at any time prior to that time that gabby's body was located did you consider calling her parents to let them know what had happened answer i was i was concerned for everybody everything you know so you know it's very difficult to deal with so i don't know what the hell to think so Question, well, your concern for everybody, did that include Joe Petito and Nicole Schmidt? Answer, yeah, yeah, I was, I was worried about everybody. I was worried about Gabby. I was worried about everybody. Okay, so what did you do with that concern about Joe Petito and Nicole Schmidt? Answer, I left it in my attorney's position there. Question, okay, more of a statement. Answer, I don't know what the right thing to do. I don't know how to respond to any of this and still to this day, so I don't. I don't know how anybody would handle it, so I relied on attorney Stephen. All I knew and that was that. Question, okay. Answer. And then I wasn't, I couldn't have thought anything. I care about everybody. You know, I don't know what you're, what we're getting at here. Question. Oh, you know what we're getting at. The lawyers. Answer. No. Question. That's what this lawsuit's about answer that i cared for everybody no answer that i cared for anybody i do i did care and i don't call him because it was you know it was the advice not to question that was attorney bertolino's advice to you is to keep quiet yeah yeah did he specifically advise you not to call the petitos yeah i mean not the petitos but don't speak to anybody about this the amount of talking around and not giving clear answers and saying i don't even know what you're getting at they're like it's literally the point of the whole lawsuit you cared for gabby petito she lived with you you say you love her and you never ever consider calling her parents after you get a frantic phone call saying gabby's gone help me it goes on to say okay did you have a conversation with attorney bertolino about gabby's family no no i didn't we talked about a lot of things so i don't know if we talked about that specifically question well from the moment that you got this phone call when the stuff hit the fan until gabby's body was located did you have a conversation with attorney bertolino about the petito about joe petito and or nicole schmidt answer about them what i'm sure we talked about them i don't know okay what do you recall talking about i don't recall anything did he specifically tell you not to talk to them he said not to speak to anybody. Did he tell you specifically not to speak to Joseph Petito and Nicole Schmidt? Not that I remember. Okay, did he tell you not to take their phone calls if they tried to reach you? He said not to talk to anybody. Did he tell you not to respond to them on Facebook or text if they reached out? We were told not to respond to anybody. When is the first time Brian spoke with attorney Bertolino? The day he got home, he came home September 1st. So then they talk about this Brian returning home after this frantic phone call. Brian returned home September 1st, correct? Correct. Driving Gabby's van, yes. What did he say? Not much. We said hello. How did he seem? He seemed okay. He seemed okay? That's what he said, yeah. Question, just days before Gabby was gone, and now he's okay? Answer, he said, I said he seemed okay, yes. Question, okay, he wasn't upset? Answer, at that point, no. He wasn't angry? No, he was confused, but you know, very subtle. So I don't, but something was wrong. Question, what was he confused about? I have no idea. You know, he just seemed, you're asking me how he was. I'm saying, you know, he was like a kid who came home, you know, in trouble. But that's how he seemed. A kid who came home in trouble for what? I have no idea. Question, which is not really a question. Okay, all right. Answer, I have no idea. Question, well, let's connect the dots. This is the Petito's lawyer. Let's connect the dots. He told you Gabby was gone. He's frantic, he's upset. He's like a kid that came home and he was in trouble. Did that lead you to believe he murdered Gabby? No. No. 
I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. Question, did you ever ask him what happened? I asked him when I was on the phone and he panicked and freaked out. So I don't, I don't, I didn't ask. After that, did you ask him? No. Why not? I, I didn't want, I didn't know what to do. At that point, we were told not to discuss. Stephen Bertolino, the attorney, asked me, don't discuss with Brian. And that's what I did. Do not discuss. He told you, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, he asked me not to discuss anything with Brian. He didn't want you to talk to your own son about what possibly might have happened out in Wyoming? Answer, yeah. He asked me, you know, don't get into it, you know? Question, were you concerned for Gabby? Answer, yes. Question, what was your concern? Answer, where is she? Where is she? He then goes on to answer another question saying, all I know is that, you know, I was waiting for Brian to tell me something. And the attorney said, quote, did you have a concern that her lifeless body might be out in the woods somewhere unprotected? Answer, of course I wondered about Gabby. So, well, I don't know where she was. I don't know what to do. So, you know, at that point I was following the advice and I'm not speaking of Gabby to Brian. So the advice was, do not ask him anything. Do not talk to Brian about anything. Just let it be. Later on in the deposition, it asks about the FBI investigation. Question, did you ever learn at any time that you and or your wife were subject of a criminal investigation? Answer, yes. Question, when? When the FBI was speaking about Roberta knowing something. When was that? Answer, I don't know. It was, I guess, I really don't know. Question, was it before or after Gabby's body was found? Answer, I think it was after. And do you know the date Gabby's body was found? Yes. What? What's the date? The 19th. Question of September? Of September, yeah. So it was after September 17th that you learned that you were possibly the subject of a criminal investigation or your wife was. Answer, well, no, but I, I don't, I don't, what's the question again? You just told me a moment ago that you learned after Gabby's death that your wife was possibly the subject of a criminal investigation, correct? Well, that's when I... Yeah, that's when she was. Okay, for what? Question, they thought it had some sort of communication or some sort of electronic thing. And then they get into the fact that when Brian came home, he got a new cell phone and Roberta went with him to purchase a new cell phone. So it does seem, and there's been lots of questions, why haven't the laundry parents ever been charged with anything? And it seems like they were really looking. And Roberta went to go buy a cell phone with him after he returned. They then get into questioning about the statement from September 14th. Question, what led you to believe it was a difficult time for the Petito family at that point? Well, everything that occurred, meaning what? Meaning everything. Question, meaning Gabby was missing and no one knew where she was? Answer, yeah. Okay, how is it a difficult time for the laundry family? Answer, we were worried about everything, just the same. Question, what were you worried about? Answer, what occurred? Question, what do you mean, what occurred? Answer, Gabby's missing and Brian's missing. Question, so did there come a point between the time Brian disclosed to you that Gabby was gone and the issuance of the statement on September 14th that you thought that maybe she didn't just walk away? Answer, it was, it was becoming more of a thought, I guess, yeah. Question, is it fair to say by this point in time you knew she was dead? Answer, I don't know. You don't know? No. Okay, but you had a suspicion that she was, correct? Answer, unfortunately, it was a thought, yeah. Question, okay, it goes on to state, it is our understanding that the search has been organized for Ms. Petito in or near Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming, right? How did that come to be your understanding? Answer, that was in the news. It was in the news? I thought so. Questioning goes on to say, it is our hope. So that's his, yours, or your wife's, correct? Answer, yes, talking about Stephen Bertolino. Question, quote, and the search for Ms. Petito is successful in that she is reunited with her family, right? Yes. Question, if she was dead, she couldn't be reunited with her family, could she? Answer, reunited is a term for either or, I think. Question, either or what? Answer, well, deceased or not. He then goes on to say, Christopher Laundry, that is, well, reunited means reunited. And that is how the entirety of Christopher Laundry's deposition goes back and forth back and forth with very vague answers. 
This would not have flown well in court, though if the accusations are true that the Petito family was gloating in text messages, that would not have flown well in court. It's just, it's difficult. But the laundries weren't going to look good at trial. And Christopher Laundry had more definitive answers where you can tell that he, at least in his gut, thought that Gabby Petito was deceased before that statement was released. Does that make the statement a statement that can be sued over? Not necessarily. Does it go a little bit further? Yes. But this kind of evasiveness does not play well in front of a jury. And it's frustrating to go through this deposition and the level of evasiveness and part answers that are there. Let's take a look at Roberta Laundrie's deposition. The beginning of Roberta Laundrie's deposition is very similar to that of her husband's, and it becomes clear that she was sitting in on her husband's deposition. So she watched her husband's deposition. The Petito Schmitz watched all the depositions. And when Roberta Laundrie's deposition is given, uh, Christopher Laundrie is present, Stephen Bertolino is present, and Joseph Petito and Nicole Schmidt are present. So everybody's present at all of these depositions. So they did have a mini trial where they saw all of this happen together. And the beginning of it again was, what was your son like? When was he born? Those types of questions. Did you know your son and Gabby Petito had gotten engaged? When did they tell you they got engaged? Did you love her? The answer was yes. Did you have a good relationship? Yes. When was she living with you? And all of that kind of foundational stuff. What was interesting in this one is they asked Roberta, in 2021, did you become aware they were going on a trip? Yes. How did you become aware of that? Oh, a little less than a week before they were leaving, we discovered that they were, they had moved stuff into storage and then they were fixing up their van and we sort of put two and two together and we said, we think they're going away. Question, how did you discover they were moving into storage? I think Chris found a receipt and then I think we finally asked them about the receipt and they said, yeah, we moved stuff into storage. A week before the trip. Now, when she talks about the burn after reading letter, she says she knew about the trip for months. There's a lot of um, contradiction in the timeline of when Roberta discovered they were going on this trip and how long she thought they would be gone. But in both Roberta and Chris Laundrie's depositions, it seemed that they thought that they were just kind of going up to New York and coming back down. But then why move all the stuff into storage? Like, does no one ask any questions ever? I, I It's just, they're like, well... They moved everything out and uh, they had a storage unit and we saw a receipt. And so we figured they were going on a trip like a week before they left indefinitely. They talk about how regularly they communicate on trips. And Roberta was saying, well, we don't normally communicate when he's on a trip. And the last time he was on a, a camping trip or whatever, we didn't communicate at all until he was back. So when people are on a trip, we just don't communicate. She was also asked about the police uh, contact in Moab and said she had no idea about that. She didn't uh, see anything about that until it came up on the news. And this is getting into the phone conversations between Roberta and Brian, which is Roberta saying, I don't remember exactly which call it was. I don't know, but I remember we had a long, long talk. I thought we talked for a long time and it was, I just told him about our summer and what we were doing and caught up with him with information about the boys, told him about the race, the boys, the grandkids who Christopher Laundry doesn't know their last name told him about the race, told him about the weekend at Daytona. So I remember that conversation. This is the day that your husband said you had a phone conversation with him when the stuff hit the fan. Yeah, I remember at the very tail end of the conversation with him where everything seemed fine as we were saying goodbye, he all of a sudden completely changed. He sounded very upset and his voice was very upset and I don't know why and I didn't want to push him. So I, we just said goodbye, but it left on a very, he was very upset. And so I got off the phone. I told Chris, you know, Brian sounded upset. Maybe you should call him. Now, the attorney didn't jump in right here with the spousal privilege. So Brian's on the phone holding it together with his mom going through all the whatever. And then at the end of the call, it is a complete 180. I don't know how I feel about that. But then she tells her husband to call Brian. And it goes on to say, well, according, the question is, according to the records I have, your husband didn't talk to Brian until... I'll withdraw that. According to the records I have, you spoke with Brian for an extended period of time on the 29th 
it looks like it's a total of 54 minutes. Does that sound correct? And then they go through the phone records some more. Question, did Brian tell you in that conversation that he needed a lawyer? No. And you can't explain why either immediately after you were speaking with Brian or during the phone call, your husband called attorney Bertolino. No, I thought he called Brian. Your husband testified yesterday that Brian told him that Gabby was gone. Did Brian ever tell you that? No. Okay, how did you find out that Gabby was gone? Answer, I guess Chris told me after he got off the phone with him. I don't know why the attorney's not objecting to spousal privilege at this point, but he's not. Question, okay, and what did you understand, quote, gone to mean? Answer, I wasn't sure. I didn't, I didn't even remember what I thought. I just know from the tone of Chris's voice, it was something serious. The attorney should have been objecting. This is all covered by spousal privilege. Every, every conversation between Chris and Roberta shouldn't be coming in at deposition and definitely wouldn't come in at trial. But we know that Chris thought the stuff hit the fan from his own deposition and that his tone of voice to his wife was that this was something serious. Question, okay, your husband described his voice as frantic. Would you agree when you spoke with him he was frantic? This is regarding Brian. Answer, I would just say upset. I don't think he was frantic. He was definitely upset. He didn't, he was very upset. He didn't sound like himself. I knew something was wrong. So that's the day the shit hit the fan. The questioning goes on to say, why would you make a phone call to attorney Bertolino if you didn't know what gone meant? Well, Chris told me Brian wanted to call a lawyer and you didn't say why? I think that's when Chris was telling me that Brian was saying, Gabby's gone, please call a lawyer. Question, so if Gabby's gone, please call a lawyer. Doesn't that say to you she's dead? Answer, I don't know what to think. I don't remember if that crossed my mind or if I was just so nervous, I just thought he was in some kind of trouble. I don't know. Question, what other possible explanation could there be for she's gone, please call a lawyer? Answer, a lot of things ran through my head. Possibly they got into a fight and, you know, maybe she's going to press charges against him or something. I don't know. And then they go down that line of questioning of, well, what, what were you thinking and what did you think? And at one point she says, so much has happened since then, it's hard for me to remember what I was thinking. But the questioning is very pointed and Attorney Riley keeps saying, but then you didn't think that she had been murdered. Then you didn't think there was something wrong. Then you didn't think... <sighs> on and on and on. Then one of the uh, stranger things they were talking about, well, if you're thinking that Gabby maybe just broke up with your son and walked away, we've got some questions. Question, what did you speak with Brian about on August 29th at about 10 o'clock? Answer, that was when he said he was driving home. Question, and in that conversation with him, did you ask him any details about Gabby being gone? Answer, no. Question, why not? Answer, I don't know. I guess I was nervous, upset, tired. I think at some point Stephen had already said, don't talk about anything I can't remember. So for me, it seems that after Chris Laundry got off the phone with Stephen Bertolino, that Stephen Bertolino told both Chris and Roberta Laundry, do not ask your son anything about what happened. Because otherwise, after receiving a frantic phone call from your child, where they say that their fiance is gone and they are coming home without them in their van, that the first thing you would ask them is what happened. So it seems that after whatever Chris conveyed to Stephen Bertolino, it was enough that Stephen Bertolino as a lawyer said, do not talk to him about anything, which is probably the appropriate legal advice in the situation because there is no privilege between what Brian Laundrie says to Christopher and Roberta. There can be protected conversations, privileged conversations that cannot be discussed in court or in deposition without waiving the privilege between the lawyer and the parties involved separately, as long as they're not all together in a room because then, you know, there's no privilege between like Brian and, and Bertolino or between Christopher and Bertolino or between Roberta and Bertolino. Those are all privileged. Roberta and Christopher waived that to have this deposition. And then the things between Roberta and Christopher are all privileged. But anything Brian said to the parents is not protected. So I 100% think Bertolino talked to Christopher Laundrie and then said, you're not asking your son a single goddamn thing about all of this. He needs to call me immediately. Do not discuss anything because it won't be safe. And it seems that they didn't, or at least that's what they're saying. The next question is, this is a girl you told me you loved, someone you loved, someone who was going to become a part of your family. 
and you asked no questions about her of your son when you learned she was gone, correct? Answer, correct. Question, weren't you concerned about her? Answer, I was, but I think I was, it was my son. I was concerned for my son. I think that's an honest answer. Question, what were you concerned about your son? Answer, he was driving home, he was upset. I knew he wanted Chris to call a lawyer. And so I knew things were, so I think I was just telling him, you know, if you're coming home, I don't remember what we talked about. I just remember he said he was coming home and I don't, I didn't ask him anything. Question, if Gabby had just walked off on her own, would you have told your son to drive home in her van with all her stuff in it? Answer, no, I didn't tell him to drive home. He just said he was on his way home. And I thought it really is Brian's van. Maybe her parents would pick her up or come get her. I didn't know. Question, well, you told me that the title, you told me that you saw the title was in Gabby's name. So why would you think it was Brian's van? Answer, because I believe he paid for it. He worked on it. I believed it was his. And I think it was just a nice gesture that he put it in her name. I knew that she couldn't afford to pay for her or didn't want to pay for her. She was leasing a car and she didn't want, and Brian was paying for the lease and she finally drove home and left the car at her parents' house. And I think he just wanted to put the van in her name to be nice, but I don't remember her even driving it. So then they're talking about why would Gabby's belongings be in the car? And aren't you aware that the FBI recovered like her laptop and all her electronic devices from your home? They came in from the car. And it was, I just, I just thought that I wasn't really looking at what he brought into the house. I didn't know it was Gabby's stuff and I didn't really pay attention to it. And then we get into a very long series of questioning of no, my attorney told me not to ask him anything. My attorney told me not to speak with anyone. My attorney told me not to speak with anyone and therefore I did not communicate with anyone from Gabby's family. I was told not to speak to anyone. What's interesting though, is they talk about Brian coming home and they talk about things kind of going on as normal and going to Fort DeSoto to go camping together. And they said that they called attorney Bertolino and asked if they could go camping. Question, Ms. Laundrie, at some point Brian left your house and I think your husband testified yesterday that it was September 13th. Does that sound correct? Yes. Answer, by the way, does Mr. Bertolino still represent you and your husband? I believe so, yes. Question, so when Brian left, what was his demeanor? When he left that morning to go hiking, he was just going hiking. Question, you knew he was leaving to go hiking? Answer, yes. Question, Attorney Bertolino has stated on several occasions that Brian was grieving when he left. Was he grieving? Answer, I didn't see him as grieving. I wouldn't use the word grieving. I don't know. He was, I guess, worried and concerned. And I know he was talking to Stephen on the phone. And But we tried to keep, keep things. Stephen Bertolino told us just to keep him close, keep him calm, and that's what we did. Question, did you ever see him grieving after he returned on September 1st? Answer, I don't know if I, I don't know what he was thinking or feeling. Question, he's your son, right? Answer, nods head. Question, and you never discussed what happened out in Wyoming with him? Answer, no. Question, did attorney Bertolino tell you why you shouldn't discuss it with him? Answer, no. He just told us to keep him safe, keep him close, and don't talk to him about anything. He was representing Brian. That was his, Brian was Steven's client, and that was it. We just stayed in the background, kept him safe, kept him close. And she repeats it multiple times that keep him safe, keep him close was the advice from Bertolino. Don't talk to him, keep him safe, keep him close. At this point, I think Bertolino was probably worried about Brian, but it's difficult to parse through what this family was going through from their perspective in the days after Brian Laundrie returned home and they went camping as a family. They talk about the statement. Roberta echoed a lot of what Christopher said about the statement made to the public on September 14th, that they were trying to calm the public down and that they were scared. Her words are, question, what was the purpose of releasing this statement? Answer, oh, there was so much. There were people outside our doors, banging on our doors, banging on our windows, sending us death threats. It was, I think the purpose was sort of just to calm the public down so that we'd know we did extend our best wishes to the Petitos because the people were screaming that we were horrible things at us and that we felt that this would calm them down so that they would know we we do care and we were hoping it would calm the public. It was a very scary time. We couldn't leave the house. It was very frightening. Question, did it calm the public down? Answer, no. 
Question, what about this statement led you to believe it might calm the public down? Answer, that we did care, that they were demanding a statement from us and we just felt we should give them a statement if they're demanding a statement from us or it could get even worse. Question, why at this time? Answer, I don't remember why at this time. It was the 14th, so Brian had disappeared and that's when the media started to pressure us and to get very ugly and not just the media, but all kinds of crazy people. Question, the statement says there's an extremely difficult time for both the Petito family and the Laundry family. Answer, yes. Question, how is it difficult for the Laundry family? Answer, we didn't know where Brian was and he was missing. And I think that we had people screaming outside the door. It was just a difficult time. Question, but you said you reported it to the police on the 13th, right? Well, the day he left, which I think was the 13th. Question, right, and this was, Answer, oh no, the police, no, we reported it to the FBI and they had a liaison and I just assumed they, the Northport Police Department and the FBI Police Department had a liaison, so I assumed if we were reporting it to the FBI that they're going to report it, you know, they're going to share their information. Question, you are certain you reported to the FBI the night of the 13th? This is Brian missing. Answer, yes. Question, okay. Answer, not me personally, Brian's attorney. And then they get back into the statement given 16 or 17 days after Brian called and said that Gabby was gone. Question, what hope did you have that at that time the search for Miss Petito was going to be successful? Answer, we hoped for the best. We hoped they would find her and that she would be fine and that was our hope. We hoped for the best and we sincerely hoped for the best and wanted to extend that to the Petito Schmidt family. Question, what led you to believe she might be reunited with her family? Answer. Well, nothing led me to believe. I just hoped it. They were looking for her. So, question. Well, you pretty much knew she was dead at that time, didn't you? Then there's an objection, and then she says, no, I hope for the best. We planned for the worst in case we got Brian a lawyer, but we certainly hoped for the best. So in both of these statements, I think we are getting acknowledgments from both of the laundries that at the time the statement came out, they at least were contemplating that Gabby was no longer alive. But then when they're asked directly about it, they backtrack and say, no, no, we were hopeful, we were hopeful, we were hopeful. And we put out the statement to calm the public down. We wanted them to think that we cared. We wanted the public to see that we cared because we wanted them to stop screaming in our windows. And legally speaking, if you take some of the emotion out of it, that's not going to fit under IIED because it's not directed at the Petitos. It's directed at saving their own ass. I don't know if a jury would feel that way after listening to them testify, but they are saying, we put this statement out to try to get people to stop sending us death threats, and it didn't work. But it wasn't truly directed at the Petitos. It was directed at making everything stop. And then they ask it directly. Pat Riley says, question, you knew when this statement was issued, she wasn't going to be reunited alive with her family. Isn't that correct? No, I didn't know. I didn't know Gabrielle was gone until I heard it on the news. Mr. Riley, on September 16th, the Northport police announced that they knew exactly where Brian was. Answer, yes. Question, do you recall that? Answer, yes. Did you call and ask them where he was? Answer, no. I didn't call and ask them where he was. I was just relieved that they knew where he was. I was very happy when I heard that they knew where he was. Three days after they reported him missing to the FBI, Northport police reports that they know exactly where Brian is and she does not call them. It goes on. Question, well, you were desperate to know where he was, weren't you? Answer, yeah, I wanted to know where my son was. Question, if someone knew where he was, wouldn't you want to know that? Answer, yeah. But as long as the police knew where he was, I was like relieved. I said, okay, good. I guess eventually the police will bring him back home or I'll get to visit him. I was, you know, I didn't need to know exactly where he was. The police knew where he was, and I was like, good, they've got him. Question, you'd get to visit him where? Answer, wherever the police had him. I mean, they said, we have, we know where Brian is. So I said, great, I'll get to see him wherever he is. Question, did you suspect at that time he might be in jail? Answer, actually, I didn't really think about that. They just said that they knew where he was, and I just assumed that they knew where he was. And that would be at their headquarters. I mean, I don't know. Where else would he be if he wasn't at my house? Question, jail. The lawyer straight up, jail. I mean, where would he be if he wasn't at my house? Lawyer, jail. Answer, and the police knew where he was. Question, did you think maybe jail? Answer, I don't know. Maybe I just, the police had him, so I didn't know where they put people 
when they have them. I was just happy that they knew where he was. Three days after she reports her son missing, after her son's attorney had said, keep him close, keep him safe, the police say, we know exactly where Brian Laundrie is, and they do nothing. They don't call the police. They don't call and say, um, did you arrest our son? They don't apparently call Stephen Bertolino and say, could you call the police? They seem to know where Brian is. It's three days after he's missing. Can we find out where the fuck our missing child is? It makes it hard for me to believe a lot of what she is uh, saying. And then I think for me, we get some clarification on what the word gone means. And we haven't even gotten to the burn after reading letter yet. Quote, the news about Gabby Petito is heartbreaking. The Laundry family prays for Gabby and her family. Did I read that correctly? And this is a statement uh, put out by text by Stephen Bertolino the day it's discovered uh, that Gabby's body's discovered. Yes. And that was sent on September 19th of 2021. Did you know that message was going to go out? Answer, I don't remember. Stephen usually discusses statements with us. Well, that must have been when they found Gabrielle. If this was the 19th, that must have been that Gabrielle's death, that must have been on the news. Yes, September 19th. I remember that was the day it was on the news that Gabrielle had passed. Question, how was the news heartbreaking to the Laundry family? Oh, it was heartbreaking in so many ways. Just to know Gabrielle was gone. And it was just heartbreaking. Question, so it wasn't heartbreaking before that. Answer, well, I didn't know she was gone until it was on the news. And then that's when it was like, that's when it was very heartbreaking. Well, the words your husband told you on August 29th were that she was gone, right? Right. Answer. That was concerning, but heartbreaking. Our hearts were broken when we found out Gabrielle was gone, deceased. So somewhere between Brian Laundry calling and saying Gabrielle's gone and them seeing on the news that she was gone, then it was heartbreaking, but she uses the same word, gone, repeatedly. I don't know if it's just because it comes up so much in this deposition or not, but she uses the word gone repeatedly to describe Gabby Petito being dead. They ask her about an incident where she's emailing Brian about Tide sticks, and the attorney asks her very pointedly, are you telling Brian how to get blood, how to get a blood stain out of a t-shirt? She says, no. And the attorney says, so it's a coincidence it was sent the same day he told you that he murdered, excuse me, that Gabby was gone. Yes. So the day that Roberta Laundry is told that Gabby is gone, there is an email about t-shirts and tide sticks. And the lawyers seem to think that that email means that she was telling Brian how to get blood out of a shirt. And she's like, no, I didn't mean that at all. Unfortunately, we don't have the email. The next exhibit is the burn after reading letter. She said she wrote the burn after reading letter right before they left, like just a few days. Question, but your understanding of that trip, I think, according to your prior testimony, is that they were just going up to New York. Answer, yeah, they told me they were going up to New York, but I guess from seeing them empty the storage unit, I was kind of beginning to suspect that they were going to be gone longer. Question, did you have a disagreement over him leaving? No, not a disagreement, but I did express that I was disappointed. I thought he was, I had waited for us to move in together and I went back to New York and I couldn't wait until we could all live together, which I know is silly. He's a grown up boy, but I thought he would live for us for a while and save his money and work and put it away. I know he wanted to buy a house. So I expressed I was disappointed, but he's a grown boy and he can do what he wants. And so a teeny, you know, I just, thought maybe we were growing apart and we were growing apart because he's growing up. He's not a little boy anymore. Question, did you write this letter because you were concerned that he didn't know you loved him? Answer, I thought he might be concerned since I was disappointed that he might think, yeah, I don't love him. But no, I mean, I really didn't think, I just wanted to reassure him that I loved him no matter what, no matter if he moved away, if he decided to stay out West, if he, whatever he did, if he didn't buy a house and decided to do something else, I don't know. Whatever he did, I would always love him. Question, why did you write burn after reading on it? And then it goes through the same explanation we've seen in the media multiple times that it's because of um, a book that Gabby had given Brian that said burn after writing about expressing your deepest, darkest thoughts and then burning them after writing. It goes on to say, you didn't want this letter discovered, right? Answer, yeah, it was embarrassing. And I didn't want, you know, yeah, it's a silly letter. 
I don't want, he's a grown boy and it was a joke, really. He didn't have to destroy it. And now I think it's sweet that he saved it. It was just a little joke. She goes on to say that this letter was a joke and not a funny joke, but a joke, but like everything was a joke. It was all a joke a million times. The amount of times in the next few pages of the deposition that see, she says it's a joke is staggering. Question, then it says, no matter what we do or where we go or what we say, we will always love each other, right? Answer, right. Question, no matter what, including murder? Answer, well, I didn't say including murder, but you know, I would always love my boy no matter what. Question, and then you say, quote, if you are in jail, I will bake a cake with a file in it. Answer, yes. What led you to believe that he might be in jail? Answer, well, I went out with a series of silly examples of things that were far-fetched, like would never actually think he would end up in jail. He's such a nice, good boy. I would never imagine it. Just like I would never imagine if you read on that he would go to the moon. I didn't think he was going to suddenly go to astronaut school and go to the moon. So I was just being exaggerating and silly. And I, as I tend to be, I know I don't seem jokey, but I'm intending, I always joke. Even my tide sticks was a joke. I'm always doing jokes. Always doing jokes hurts my brain. Quote, even if they're not good jokes, I'm always joking. So I was just like making light. Like, if you go to jail, if you go to the moon, if you do that, no matter what, I'll love you. Love you, love you. And it's just a silly letter. I never imagined the future when I wrote this. Question, you understand he could have gone to jail for murder, right? Then there's an objection. Then she says, not when I wrote this letter, not ever. I wasn't actually going to put a file in a cake. Who does that? Question by Mr. Riley. And then next you say, if you need to dispose of a body, I will show up with a shovel and garbage bags. What led you to believe that he might need to dispose of a body? There's an objection. She goes on to say, I know, okay, but this is so crazy. Somebody had told me a joke and I thought it was funny. And I told people at work, I told Brian, and I thought it was the funniest joke. And somebody said to me, quote, oh, you know, a good friend is somebody that shows up with garbage bags and a shovel. Oh, somebody you can call at three o'clock in the morning and they show up with garbage bags and a shovel and they don't ask any questions. Ha ha, that's so funny. Like, that's how you know a good friend. And I thought it was a funny joke. The person that told me said it was funny and I told it to Brian. I thought it was such a funny joke. And so I was referring to the joke, but I didn't have time to write out the joke, but I knew he would know the joke I was referring to. First of all, ma'am, you are not his friend. You are his mother. So Pat Riley tries to ask a question, but she keeps going and says that I would always, you know, be there. Question, so your intent in writing this letter was to express the depth of your love to him. Answer, right. But you don't say whatever you do in life, I'll be proud of you, correct? Answer, I know that would have been better. So she keeps going on about the joke about, you know, who a good friend is, like the joke, the joke, the joke, the joke, which I don't, it, it's hyperbolic, but it goes on and on and on. And then he's like, you know, that like putting a file on a cake's a crime, right? And then she starts talking about Hotel Budapest and baking pastries with spoons in them. And then she's asked specifically, question, okay, you realize offering to help dispose of a body would be a crime? Answer, of course, but it was a joke. You wouldn't really do that. It's like joking. When I, we're going to talk about the World Trade Centers, and I didn't think there was going to be a World Trade Center analogy in this deposition, but just so you're aware, when I went to work in the World Trade Center, they, on the top floor, they had a place where tourists could come and you could get your picture taken leaping off the World Trade Center, and it was very funny. And you'd put on a funny face and then you'd pay your $10 and you'd get a picture of yourself falling off the World Trade Center. And that was so funny and everybody had funny faces. And I'm saying this because at the time it was a joke. Question, okay. The lawyer's like, okay. And she's like, answer. Later, when people actually did fall off the World Trade Center, it was not so funny. I, <sighs> A, I didn't see this coming in this deposition, but B, she's trying to explain that the jokes about burying a body didn't age well. The difference is with this undated letter is that the attorneys are still not sure that this letter was written before Gabby was murdered or after. This is just a wild deposition. It really is. She goes on to try to explain that some of the some of the things in the book are, or in the burn after reading letter are from books that they read and it's all just a big joke and everything's a joke and everything's funny. Until it's not, I suppose. 
They then ask her about the motion to seal the burn after reading letter, which I covered over on YouTube, when they were trying to seal this from the public. And they're talking about the things she wrote in her affidavit about that. The question is, quote, and this is Pat Riley, the lawyer, quoting what Roberta Laundrie said in the motion, in the affidavit connected to the motion. Question, quote, I repeat that the letter I wrote to Brian before he left with Gabby for their fateful trip was nothing more than a private communication between myself and my son, and I never expected anyone else would read it. I mean, it's like she's quoting Mean Girls. I bet the people that wrote the burn book didn't think anyone would read it. So the question is, what do you mean by, quote, fateful trip? Answer, well, we wrote that after. I mean, well, I wrote it, and then my attorney helped me write it, and we didn't know at the time it was fateful until now you know it's fateful. You know that the trip ended terribly. Question. Well, one of the definitions of fateful is ominous, meaning you knew that something's going to happen. Were you aware of that? She said, well, yes, because now we know something happened, so it was a fateful trip because that's how, like, it's sort of like the Titanic. That was a fateful trip. They didn't know it was going to sink, but it's like, oh, that fateful trip. And then the lawyer says, question, and like a three-hour tour. And at this point, it is very clear to me that in this deposition, the attorney is exhausted of going round and round and round and picking word for word with Roberta Laundry. The deposition finishes up with the attorney basically saying, so you're saying you wrote this letter before they went on the trip, but we're just going to have to take your word on that, aren't we? And she's like, yeah. So Roberta didn't really have a great explanation for the burn after reading letter because it's so on the nose. The whole thing is just, it's a joke. It's a joke. It's a joke. Isn't it so funny that it's a joke? And I don't know if that is because the letter was written in advance and it really truly did not age well, that she was trying to relate to a son that was growing up who she didn't know how to relate to anymore. Or if it was written after to give him solace when she knew he was leaving to go, quote unquote, hiking after the attorney said, keep him safe, keep him close. I don't know if we will ever know. She clearly never expected anyone would read that letter. The timing and the things in the letter, it seems like a mother saying, I forgive you for whatever you've done. I love you no matter what you've done. And remember that no matter what you did or have done, I will always love you. Because even though both laundries say they never asked Brian what was going on, they knew that whatever happened, they were suspicious, at least, that Gabby Petito was dead. And it's, it's, I, I don't know. I, I really hoped when this case settled that the Petitos would have answers. I think that this case legally is an uphill battle for them and an, a very expensive one. But going through these depositions, I think the answers are in the things they didn't say. I think the answers are in the evasiveness. And I think the answers are somewhere in between the lines of them saying, yeah, well, we were suspecting the worst and he was frantic and we called the lawyer. And then our lawyer said, do not talk to uh, one another. I don't know if it leaves you with any more answers about this case. I don't think the laundries would have presented well at trial if they answered like this i think it would have been deeply frustrating the the depositions were frustrating to read and i do try to have empathy it's a hard case neither family has their kids coming back the laundries had people banging on their windows outside their house which is completely inappropriate and egregious they didn't have an obligation legally to say anything. It just feels so awful that they didn't even let the Petitos know that Brian returned. They said nothing. And that is painful. But this would not have played well with the jury, but the legal questions still would have been difficult. So I think this is one of the more challenging cases of legality versus morality it's hard to parse there's not a legal duty or obligation here between the petitos and the laundries but you would hope as families that whose kids were getting ready to get married that there would have been some conversation but roberta laundry repeated throughout her deposition 
that she was thinking of her son first and worried about her son first. And their actions were clear that they were very afraid that whatever they did would potentially harm their son. And until he was found deceased, there wasn't much they could do. After he was found deceased, I think there was a lot more that they could do. And the lawyer asked, don't you think if you had ever reached out to the Petitos that maybe we wouldn't be here? And they were like, no, I, I haven't really considered it. And I don't know if this was just a family completely unable to process the grief that they were also going through. You never know how people are going to respond in horrific and tragic circumstances. But it does seem that they knew and that when they put the statement out to me, it seems that they have an argument that they were doing it to try to stop the harassment of them. And really, the Petitos were not in their mind. And for it to be intentional infliction of emotional distress, the Petitos would have needed to be in their mind. That's not an argument most lawyers want to stand up in court and make because it feels gross. But truly, it might have been that they were making those statements to make the harassment stop. I don't know if that helps the situation any, and we're never going to know what happens in court because this case is closed. And hopefully the families, both who have lost children, can start to heal. Let me know what you thought of all of this. I know that that was a wild ride. This is probably, I don't know how long this episode is. This is probably a very long podcast episode and we have very long days in live court. And you'll know all of that if you have the Law Nerd app and I should say more, but for now, I need to say, thank you for being here. Thank you for being a Law Nerd. May your Wi-Fi be strong. May your toilet paper be plentiful and your bidet be warm. May your travel days go smoothly when trial is afoot. I mean, that's a wish for me. Will you wish that for me, please? Because I'm going to need it. May your families be well. And may the odds be ever in your favor. Lawners, this was a long one, but it was a wild ride. And I will see you in the next one. You can stay up to date with everything I'm covering on our free iOS and Android app at lawnerdapp.com or search your app store for Law Nerd. And you can also follow me on social media at the Emily D. Baker. Remember, I stream on YouTube on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I recap all of that for you in quick bits on Monday. And of course, The Emily Show drops on Wednesdays. Thanks for being a Law Nerd.